The purpose of Free Thought Forum is to be vigilant to the encroachment of religion into government and to educate the general public as to what a free thinker is. Good afternoon. This is Free Thought Forum, and I am pleased to be uh, the host today as we have a special guest, Margaret Sanger. Margaret Sanger will be represented by Ruth Lett. Uh, this afternoon, we are honored to have you here, Margaret. And as you are the founder of Planned Parenthood, uh, I'm so happy that you have come from your um, rest in place to be with us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I was getting a little bored down there, and uh, this will be a nice change. Well, now, I know that you died on September the 6th, 1966, which is relatively recent. But would you please tell us when you were born? Well, I was born on September 24th, 1879. I spent most of my childhood in the largely Roman Catholic community of Corning, New York. Okay, tell us about your family. Did you have any brothers and sisters? Did I ever? My mother had 11 children. I do believe that fact changed the course of my life. And ultimately world history. Well, perhaps. My father, you would have liked, he was a free-thinking Irishman who was much better at stirring up controversy than providing for his family. Well, I think that the audience and the members of FACT would love to hear how you met Robert G. Ingersoll. Well, that was my first introduction to the power of the Catholic Church. My father invited Mr. Ingersoll, who he called Colonel Bob, to speak at a hall. As you know, Mr. Ingersoll was an eloquent speaker and was well paid to speak all over the country. I was just a young child and very excited because I was to accompany my father and Colonel Bob to the hall. However, the hall was owned by the local priest, Father Coughlin, and when we got there, he had shut the door. Also, some people had gathered there. Many of them had come to listen and to learn, but a few were there to just make trouble and denounce, and tomatoes, apples, and cabbages began to fly. What did your father do next? Well, he announced that the meeting would take place in the woods near our home in one hour. Well, I'll bet that that was the first time that you have come across such rage just because of a difference of opinion here from the accepted ones. Yes, it was. After that, my siblings and I were called children of the devil, and we were taunted by other children on our way to school. Oh, didn't you attend any church? I asked my father which Sunday school we should attend and he said, well, try them all, but don't be chained to any of them. So for a few years, I made the rounds. My impression of the Catholic Church <clears throat> was that it was always cold and the benches were hard. They did have some seats upholstered in soft red cloth, but they were reserved for the very rich. Right, not too surprising. Uh, you said your father was a free thinker. When did you begin thinking for yourself? Once my father heard me saying the Lord's Prayer. He asked me, what was I saying about bread and who was I talking to? I answered, God. So he asked, is God a baker? I was shocked 
and told him that it meant that God gave the sunshine and rain and all the things to make the bread. So he said, well, why don't you say what you mean then? <laughs> what is your school background? I attended three years of college in a private co-ed school, but in 1898, I had to return home to nurse my dying mother. My mother, Ann P. Higgins, had tuberculosis. She was only 48 years old when she died. I also contracted tuberculosis. I had two tubercular glands operations. Well, I understand the disease is very contagious. What else did you do? I attended nursing school in White Plains, New York. Well, um, did you ever marry? Yes, I married an artistic architect named William Sanger, and we had three children. I almost died after the birth of my son, but after a long convalescence, I did settle into the tranquil life of a homemaker. And what else did you do? In 1912, we moved back to New York City. It was an exciting time. The city was abuzz with radicals, reformers, and socialists. We rubbed shoulders with such iconoclasts as Emma Goodman, Bill Hayward, and Mabel Dodge. Um, well, and did you, did, did you participate in any of their activities? Oh, yes. I uh, supervised a campaign to relocate the children of striking textile workers in Lawrence, Massachusetts. My testimony made headlines. The international workers of the world, called Wobblies, erected a huge banner at Madison Square Garden proclaiming, No Gods, No Masters. <clears throat> this was in a demonstration planned by John Reed. That slogan caught my eye. I know, you used that slogan later for your clinics, did you not? How did that come about? Well, the turning point in my life was in July 1912. I had been called to nurse a woman by the name of Sadie Sachs. She was 28 years old and had three children. She had nearly died of a self-induced abortion. I overheard that timid woman ask the doctor how she could avoid another pregnancy. His reply threw me into action. Oh, what was his reply? His reply was, tell Jake to sleep on the roof. Really? Three months later, Mrs. Sachs died. I resolved then and there to do something to help women with fertility. I returned to obstetrical nursing of the poor. I would repeatedly beg the medical experts for the secret that would let desperate women avoid serial pregnancies. Is that when you started writing for the socialist paper? Yes. I started writing a weekly Sunday column for the call titled, What Every Wo Mother Should Know. It was later published in pamphlet form. You got into a lot of trouble over that. Well, mostly for the second one, what every girl should know, an introduction to sex for adolescents. But it was censored because I referred to syphilis and gonorrhea by their real names. Well, I know it didn't just end there. I still felt I didn't know enough. So I went to the Library of Congress, medical libraries, and then my husband and I went to Paris 
trying to find some answers. Well, it appears like France was a good choice. They used the RFU 486 pill years before it came to the USA. Well, I don't know about that pill since I've been dead since 1966. But we had our own problems with the Comstock Act of 1873. The Act defined prevention of conception as obscene, lewd, filthy, and indecent. Anthony Comstock, a religious fanatic and special agent for the post office, convicted over 3,000 individuals of violating the act and bragged about driving 15 people to suicide. Well, he sure sounds like a bad one. Uh, didn't you publish a monthly newspaper? Yes, it was called The Woman Rebel. In it, I challenged the Comstock Act. I used the motto, no gods, no masters. My friends and I brainstormed for a name for the contraceptive movement and the term birth control was born. And did you get into any trouble over that? Well, if you call being indicted on nine counts of violating the Comstock law and facing 45 years in prison, trouble. I did win a delay, and during that time I wrote Family Limitation, containing everything I had learned about birth control. I had 10,000 copies printed. And after your delay, what happened? With one day's notice, the People versus Margaret Sanger was called to trial. My attorney was denied a month's delay, and he advised me to plead guilty. That I would not do. I agonized over leaving my children, but I fled the country, leaving directions that family limitations was to be released. Well, I happen to know that it sold 10 million copies and was translated into 13 different languages. Well, where did you go? I went to England and continued learning. I met Havelock Ellis, the British sexologist, and formed a long friendship. I also interned at a family planning clinic in the Netherlands, fitting 75 women with diaphragms. And uh, why did you return to the United States? Well, because of my estranged husband. Estranged? That's a long story. Anyway, he was entrapped. William Sanger was arrested by Comstock for giving a copy of Family Limitations to an undercover officer and was jailed for one month. During William's trial, Comstock died of complications of a cold. I turned for support with my pending prosecution to Mary Ware Dennett of the National Birth Control League, but she turned me down. And didn't you have some other tragedy at that time? It was November 1915, and my beloved daughter, Peggy, died of pneumonia. Oh, I'm so sorry, but could you tell us something about the trial? My attorneys advised me to plead guilty, but I decided to defend myself. I was very grateful that H.G. Wells and some other famous British authors wrote President Wilson on my behalf. Mm. What about the feminists? Did, didn't they help you out? Did you get any support from them? Yes, by early 1916, with a new trial pending, they did gravitate to my support. I gave a pre-trial speech at a dinner describing myself as a nurse working in the slums who saw a fire and shouted for help. 
My trial made front pages and the charges were dropped. The Comstock laws, however, remained unchanged. And did you stop fighting for birth control for women? Not at all. In April of 1916, I started a lecture tour sparking regional birth control leagues wherever I spoke. Catholics protested and sometimes had me arrested. Well, they're still protesting. I'm not surprised. I realized that women needed clinics, not speeches. So I resolved to open one in an immigrant neighborhood. I couldn't find a doctor to help me, but that didn't stop me. On October 26, 1916, with a supporter and my sister, we opened our Brooklyn clinic. I bet you heard some sad stories there. Plenty. One patient said that a priest advised her to have lots of children. She had 15, nine who died, and was only 37 years old. Why do you suppose the priest advised her to have so many children? Well, let me see. Uh, 15 children means 15 baptismal fees, nine baby funerals, masses and candles. But the biggest cost is the physical torment of the parents. I asked myself, is this the price of Christianity? Well, Margaret, I think you'd be surprised that the Catholic Church just hasn't changed much. Not really. Uh, did the clinic prosper? Ten days after I opened, the clinic was raided. Police harassed patients and confiscated 400 case records. Ethel was tried first and convicted. She was sentenced to a month on Blackwell's Island, where she went on a food and water strike. She was brutally forced, fed, and nearly died. Well, we have some uh, Planned Parenthood clinics who can relate to, to that situation. Only today, they bomb the buildings and they kill the doctors and workers. But uh, can you tell us what became of Ethel? Her treatment raised the national conscience, and my supporters and I obtained a governor's pardon and rescued Ethel. It took a year of convalescence to recover from 10 days in prison. In 1917, the New York Supreme Court upheld the conviction, but ruled that contraceptive advice could be given for cure and prevention of disease. Uh, did you write any other books or, or pamphlets? While I was taking a three-month rest cure in California, I wrote William and the New Race. It sold a quarter million copies. You know, if Christianity turned back the clock of general progress a thousand years, it turned back the clock 2,000 years for women. The greatest outrage is to forbid women to control the function of motherhood under any circumstances. Well, I agree with that. Uh, I know that you launched the American Birth Control League. Uh, what else did you do around this time? I planned the first national birth control conference. I spoke on birth control. Is it moral? It was canceled on the orders of Catholic Archbishop Patrick J. Hayes, and they arrested me again. Ah, you were invited to speak in Japan. How did that go? Not very well. I was invited to speak in Japan along with Albert Einstein, Bertrand Russell, and H.G. Wells. The four of us were to take part in lectures on Western thought. The United States denied me a visa in 1911. But later, I was permitted to enter Japan, and I gave 13 lectures and had approximately 
five hundred interviews. And what about the clinic in New York? In 1922, I hired a woman physician to run the birth control clinic. I received large volumes of mail with requests for help from women around the country. Those letters formed the basis for my book, Motherhood in Bondage. I couldn't be everywhere at one time, so I financed a gynecologist, Dr. James E. Cooper, to lecture to audiences of physicians. Cooper gave more than 700 speeches, teaching techniques, and signed up 20,000 physicians who agreed to take referrals of patients needing birth control. Uh, didn't I read somewhere that you had a lot of trouble getting diaphragms? Indeed. Dr. Hannah Stone donated her services at the Brooklyn Clinic, and I provided the clinic with 500 to 1,000 diaphragms a week. I had to illegally bootleg them through the Canadian factory of my second husband. Uh, second husband? That's another story. But getting back to the diaphragms, Dr. Stone and I designed an inexpensive jelly to use with the diaphragms based on lactic acid and glycerin. The diaphragm used with the jelly was 98% effective. And did you stop having trouble at the clinic? Comstock may have been dead, but the Catholic officials continued to try to censor me. After five years in operation, my clinic was raided in 1919 at the demand of Archbishop Hayes. Well, what about in 1932? Were things getting better then? Somewhat. By that time, there were 50 birth control clinics in the U.S. and another 50 in Europe. I wrote my book, My Fight for Birth Control, during this time. And what were some of your other problems? I heard that Japan had an improved diaphragm, so I ordered some samples. They were destroyed by customs under the Comstock Law. I got so tired of the congressional hearings being dominated by religionists with their same monotonous chant of medieval dogma. Uh, in 1934, Judge Moskowitz of New York ruled in U.S. versus our package that the Comstock Law did not apply to contraceptives. When did the Comstock Law die? Well, finally, in January 1937, after 63 years. Did you retire? I have to admit that I was forced out of my original birth control league. But in 1939, a merger took place, and I became honorary president of the group that later became Planned Parenthood. Uh, did you finally retire? No. After World War II, I revived the worldwide birth control movement. I still wasn't wanted everywhere, and at the demand of Catholic groups, General MacArthur personally barred me from visiting Japan. I was 73 when I finally made the trip in 1952. I also planned a world conference in India that year. It was sponsored by Eleanor Roosevelt and Albert Einstein, among many others. That conference resulted in the organizing of the International Planned Parenthood Federation, which I'm proud to say elected me president. And so then you retired. No, I was always seeking a better form of birth control. In the 1950s, through a financial sponsorship with Mrs. McCormick, we set up Gregory Pincus, an expert in mammalian biology, to study steroid hormones. And did you get any federal funding? No, 
They were too afraid of the Catholic Church. Tell me, Miss Sanger, have you ever heard of the pill as a method of birth control? Mrs. McCormick and I sponsored laboratory studies by Dr. M.C. Chang. Dr. John Rock, father of the pill, tried out steroids on volunteers at the same time. The pill, tested more than any drug in history, was released in 1960. Well, thank you, Miss Sanger, for all you did for women and for being here today. Margaret Sanger died in a Tucson nursing home at nearly 87 years of age. However, she lived long enough to savor the June 1965 decision of the U.S. Supreme Court invoking the constitutional right of privacy, striking down a law, declaring contraceptives to be criminal. All this information on Margaret Sanger was taken from this book, Women Without Superstition, edited by Annie Laurie Gaylor. Uh, we have a few minutes, and thank you so much, Ruth, for being with us. Thank you, light. Catherine Ferringer, for allowing me to host this program today. And just as a matter of information that I thought was kind of interesting, I'm going to uh, give you a little information on the double standard in America. You believe we have one? I certainly do. Okay. It, it took the FDA's approval. It took 26 years for the approval of the birth control pill for women. It took uh, 12 years for the abortion pill for women and six months for Viagra for men. <laughs> so that gives us a little bit of insight. Again, thank you all for coming today, the audience, and thank you for listening. And good afternoon, Margaret and Ruth. I think as I please, and this gives me pleasure. My conscience decrees, this right I must treasure. My thoughts will not cater to duke or dictator. No person can deny, dig a dog and sin fry. No person can deny, dig a dog and sin fry. My thoughts will burst free like blossoms in season. Foundations will crumble and structures will tumble. And free people shall cry, dig a dog and sin fry. And free people shall cry, dig a dog and